world news tonight. A big thumbs up. Pfizer BioNTech's COVID-19 vaccine gets the full approval of the FDA after months of withholding. Swirling disaster. Typhoon Omasis leaves South Korea with extensive damage in its wake. Building tides. US Vice President visits Singapore to improve regional tides against China. And stone cold fun. Singapore opens its first ice cream museum. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with a look into the ongoing COVID pandemic. India's drug regulator has granted emergency use approval for Zydus Cadillas COVID-19 vaccine, the world's first DNA shot against the coronavirus in adults and children aged 12, 12 years and above. And for more on this, let's cross over to other than a World News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekar, who joins us now from Delhi in India. Gayatri? Yes, Shanali. The approval gives to boost to India's vaccination program which aims to inoculate all eligible adults by December and will provide the first shot for those under 18 as the country still struggles to contain the virus spread in some states. The vaccine, Psycovid D, uses a section of generic material from the virus that gives instruction as either DNA or RNA to make the specific protein that immune systems recognize and responds to. Unlike most COVID-19 vaccines, which needs two doses or even a single dose, Psycov T is administered in three doses. The generic drug maker listed as Kedla Healthcare Limited aims to make 100 million to, 200, uh, to 120 million doses of Psycov D annually and has already begun stockpiling the vaccine. Cyrus Kedla's vaccine, developed in partnership with the Department of uh, Biotechnology, is the second homegrown shot to get emergency authorization in India after Bharat Biotech's co-vaccine. The drug maker said in July its COVID-19 vaccine was effective against the new coronavirus mutants, especially the Delta variant, and that the shot is administered using a needle-free applicator as opposed to the uh, traditional syringes. Cyrus Kedla had also submitted data evaluating a two-dose regime for the shot in July and plans to seek regular, uh, regulatory approval for the same. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Other Therena World News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekar and reporting from Delhi in India. We have some breaking news. A Ukrainian minister has claimed a passenger jet meant to evacuate people fleeing Afghanistan to Ukraine was hijacked at gunpoint and flown instead to Iran in an unconfirmed incident that was later denied by his own government. Ukraine's deputy minister for foreign affairs said armed hijackers seized the plane at Kabul's Hamid Khazrai International Airport where a multinational evacuation is underway ahead of a 31st August deadline for the foreign militaries to leave the country set by the Taliban. French health authorities said the number of people requiring hospital treatment for COVID-19 and those treated in intensive care units stood at the highest levels in more than two months. For more on this, let's cross over to other than a world news special correspondent Chetana Dharmaratha joining us now from Normandy in France. Chetana. Yes, Shanali. The daily new infections increased by over 5,100 in 24 hours, but were down by 11.4% compared with last week. As the Delta variant of the disease puts a renewed strain on the health system, Health Minister Oliver Barron said he was wary of what would happen after pupils returned to school in a week. He said France's main independent health authority would soon recommend a third COVID-19 vaccination for people older than 65 years. With more than 6.6 .6 million cases since the outbreak of the disease, France has the fifth highest total of infections globally. In addition, immunosuppressed people who have low or no antibodies against COVID-19 even after full vaccination will now have access to urgent preventive treatment the French Health Authority has confirmed. Back to you, Shanali. Thank you. And that was Other Than a World News Special Correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. We have some good news for you. The U.S. Food and Drug Administrations have granted full approval to the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine that had earned emergency use authorization in December last year. 
The FDA on Monday granted full approval to the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine, making it the first to secure a formal okay from the U.S. drug regulator as government and health authorities struggle to win over vaccine skeptics. During the FDA's announcement, doctors Janet Woodcock and Peter Marks said they hoped meeting the regulator's gold standard would convince unvaccinated Americans that Pfizer's shot is safe and tried to dispel misinformation about vaccines that has circulated on the Internet. President Joe Biden welcomed the full FDA approval, saying it was an important moment in the fight against COVID and called on more private businesses and local governments to require vaccinations. If you're a business leader, a nonprofit leader, a state or local leader who has been waiting for full FDA approval to require vaccinations, I call on you now to do that. Require it. Following the FDA announcement, the Pentagon said it was preparing to make the vaccine mandatory for U.S. military personnel. And New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio announced on Monday that public school teachers and staff will now be required to get vaccinated. There is entrenched vaccine skepticism among some Americans, even as COVID-19 cases driven by the highly infectious Delta variant have surged in many Republican-led southern states where vaccination rates are lower. Over the weekend, former President Donald Trump urged a rally crowd in Alabama to get vaccinated, but the message was not well received. The FDA is still waiting for additional data before deciding on fully approving Pfizer's vaccine in children ages 12 to 15 and is not yet recommending that children below 12 years of age get the vaccine. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris met top leaders in Singapore on the first working day of her trip to Southeast Asia and struck partnerships to tackle cyber threats, supply disruptions and the COVID-19 pandemic areas that have emerged as top priorities for President Joe Biden's administration. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris met with Singapore's leaders on Monday, kicking off her first visit to Southeast Asia since the start of the Biden administration. Harris met with Singapore's Prime Minister Lee Seng Lung, as well as President Halima Yaqob, with her talks aimed at broadening cooperation with Singapore to offer a counterweight to China's growing influence in the Indo-Pacific region. At a joint press conference with the Prime Minister, Harris took the opportunity to address the U.S.'s commitment to its allies in the region. I reaffirmed in our meeting the United States's commitment to working with our allies and partners around the Indo-Pacific to uphold the rules-based international order and freedom of navigation, including in the South China Sea. While Singapore is not a U.S. treaty ally, it still remains one of its strongest security partners in the region with deep trade ties. Meanwhile, later this week, Harris will travel to Vietnam to hold talks with leaders there. Watchers say part of the vice president's task during her trip to Singapore and Vietnam will be to convince leaders in both countries that Washington's commitment to the region is firm and not parallel to Afghanistan. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Stick with us. Welcome back and over in the United States, rescue teams search for dozens of people believed missing in Tennessee after record down pros and flash floods left at least 21 dead, swept cars into ditches and washed away homes and buildings. I got up this morning about 4.30, got prepared. Uh, I just can't lay in the bed when there's people losing family. Local Tennessee residents and rescue crews searched for the dozens feared missing on Monday after record rains and flash flooding ravaged parts of Tennessee over the weekend. The floods swept away homes and buildings, leaving at least 21 dead. Humphreys County Emergency Management Agency said rescuers were searching through houses, rubble and debris for 40 people still missing in the area directly west of Nashville. Record rainfall of up to 17 inches drenched some areas, sparking massive flooding on Saturday. Especially hard hit was this Humphreys County town of Waverly, where hundreds of homes were left uninhabitable. Waverly Mayor Wallace Frazier told the Tennessean newspaper that those killed in the flooding ranged in age from babies to the elderly. Tennessee Governor Bill Lee on Sunday acknowledged a, quote, tremendous loss of life. 
President Joe Biden has said the federal government stood ready to, quote, offer any assistance they need for this terrible moment. Over in Asia, the southern regions of South Korea have been enduring torrential rain and gusty winds at, as the 12th typhoon of the season made landfall in that part of the country. The intense and sudden rainstorms triggered landslides, causing property damage and prompted thousands of people to evacuate their homes. Typhoon Omaez has left the South Korean peninsula after pounding southern parts of the country with heavy rain overnight. More than 200 millimeters of rainfall flooded houses, local markets and roads. Some parts of Gyeongsangnam-do province saw almost 100 millimeters an hour of rain. The southern port city of Busan also got hit by up to 88 millimeters an hour at around midnight Tuesday. Fortunately, no injuries have been reported, but one river overflowed, forcing around 30 nearby residents to evacuate. Some people also had to be rescued after being trapped in submerged vehicles. Landslide warnings and advisories were issued, and cars were turned away from bridges due to strong winds. More than 110 damage reports have been filed in Busan. Meanwhile, in Cholanamdo province, around 12,000 residents living in areas at risk of landslides were evacuated. And more than 240 residents were evacuated to nearby community centers in Tangwon, Gyeongsangnam-do province. Although all typhoon warnings have now been lifted, heavy rain continues to fall along the eastern and southern coasts. A strong wind advisory and a heavy rain advisory have been issued for parts of Jeju Island. Many regions in the south are also under a heavy rain watch. Authorities are advising people be extra careful of potential accidents as the ground has weakened due to the heavy rain. In Asia Minor, now the summit in Kyiv aimed to bring together allies to discuss the possibilities of returning the Crimean Peninsula to Ukrainian government control. Ukrainian president said at the beginning of the conference that the region had turned into a territory where most basic rights and freedoms of the humans are regularly violated. Where foreign officials, including the president of the European Council, Charles Michel, arrived in Kiev on Monday to take part in the Crimea platform, a summit designed to keep international attention focused on returning the Crimea Peninsula back to Ukraine. According to the Ukrainian Foreign Ministry, 44 representatives of foreign states and international entities are to take part in the talks. During the summit, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky vowed to do everything possible to get back control of the peninsula so that Ukraine becomes part of Europe. In response, the European Council president stressed the EU's unwavering stance that they will not recognize the illegal annexation of Crimea by Russia. Back in 2014, Russia annexed the Crimea following the revolution in Ukraine that saw its former president and Russian ally Viktor Yanukovych ousted and the government overthrown. As a result of human action over the past half century, the Atlantic Ocean has been slowly and relentlessly consuming at a fauna 155 miles from Rio de Janeiro's capital and home for 36,000 people. Every year, the sea advances and erodes three meters of at fauna's shoreline. The fishing village north of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil is slowly being swallowed by the Atlantic Ocean. 500 buildings have already succumbed to the forces of the water. Julia Maria de Assis's property also fell by the wayside, as 13 years ago she saw the sea take was left of her family hotel. People sometimes ask, do you feel sad because this property was a hotel? No, not here. The respect for the sea is enormous, especially for the Atafona Sea. There are no hard feelings. The sea is taking what it wants to take. We are the ones who need to adapt and respect nature. Nature may be merciless, but the changes to Atfana also have a human hand. The river Paraiba do Sul supplies the southeast region of Brazil with water and is separated by 12 dams. Rio de Janeiro's metropolitan area, which is home to almost 13 million inhabitants, depend on it. Severe droughts have also reduced its flow. Experts constructed artificial barricades and deposited large quantities of sand to prevent the sea from advancing. But so far, these solutions have been insufficient.
welcome back and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. North China's Hebei province has kept forging ahead in the development of both rural and urban areas over recent years, bringing a new life of the permanent population of 74.61 million that dwells in the place spanning about 188,800 square kilometers. Australia's Queensland state will host eight rugby championship tests in double headers over four weekends from September in a rigid schedule following new COVID-19 restrictions across the country and in New Zealand. California firefighters struggle to contain the Caldor fire which has burned more than 100,000 acres and destroyed more than 600 structure. California's drought desiccated timber, brush and grasslands have created a potential fuel bed for several wildfires raging across the state. The former president of El Salvador's soccer federation pleaded guilty to a racketeering conspiracy charge arising from a global soccer corruption probe involving the payment of bribes to stage and broadcast matches. On the eve of the Tokyo 2020 Paralympics Games opening, the torch relay was again a reduced event in the Japanese capital as daily COVID-19 cases remain at record high levels. Torch bearers gathered from the special ceremony which replaced the original relay route of the Games. Russia's President Vladimir Putin met with Jordan's King Abdullah II on the sidelines of the International Military Technical Forum Army 2021 near Moscow. Putin stressed that despite the coronavirus pandemic, relations between Russia and Jordan were developing steadily. Self-driving startups like Cruise and Pony.ai have begun testing their driverless cars in some parts of California in the past year with an additional feature. When you think of driverless cars, you probably don't envisage a human sat in the front. In this case, though, there's no driver behind the wheel, but a safety operator in the passenger seat. It's a feature being used by self-driving startups like Cruise and Pony.ai which started testing their cars in some parts of California this year. For Pony.ai, which has backing from Toyota Motor Corp, it's only a temporary measure, according to CEO James Peng. Even then, though, a remote operator will monitor vehicles and provide guidance when the vehicles run into trouble. Cruise, majority owned by General Motors Co., started operating five driverless vehicles in San Francisco at night in October, with a human in the front passenger seat. According to a spokesperson, the minder has the ability to stop the vehicle at any point during the ride. Cruise says it sees the development of self-driving vehicles as not only a tech race, but also a trust race. Alphabet Inc.'s Waymo has been developing self-driving tech for more than a decade and launched the world's first commercial robo-taxis in Phoenix in 2018. But it still keeps humans in the loop, monitoring and assisting the fleet from responding to riders' questions to remotely giving a second pair of eyes in tricky situations. The continued human presence in what are supposed to be software-driven, automated vehicles underscores the challenges facing the industry. With no end in sight to the technical and regulatory obstacles to free-range driverless robo-taxis, some self-driving companies are accepting the need for human minders and scaling down their ambitions. So, according to interviews with investors and startup executives, they can start generating revenue in the near future. And finally tonight, the Museum of Ice Cream opened its first international outlet in Singapore, providing some sweet respite for residents as the country eased some coronavirus restrictions. Visitors had to book a time in advance to ensure social distancing requirements were met in the museum. The 60,000 square foot facility follows strict COVID guidelines set out by the government. Many were excited by the prospect of free flow ice cream and the interactive exhibits that they can experience with tickets that cost from 38 Singapore dollars. Head of Asia Pacific at Museum of Ice Cream Singapore said part of museum appeals is how it makes people happy. The Museum of Ice Cream said it plans to expand into more international locations soon. It will open another location in Austin, US and currently has a permanent location in New York, which is popular with influencers and frequently attracts A-list celebrities. Now that's a colorful story. Well, with that, we have to end today's episode of World News. Dani Dubitanabasam will be back again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.